All right, I guess uh, here we go then. Okay, so thank everyone for coming and uh, come to this uh, particular talk on World Plone Day. I'm going to talk about putting uh, Plone into a US government website, Plone.gov, I'm calling it, or in other words, securing the already most secure content management system there is. So uh, I'd first just like to be wistful for a little bit here and think about those innocent salad days of the past where the web looked something more like this. We didn't have to worry about uh, all sorts of uh, cyber attacks and, and information security warfare and that sort of thing. Sadly, that's not the world we live in anymore. Sam Peckinpah's version of the salad days really did turn out to be uh, the, well, the version that we're living in now. So when we want to put a content management system onto a US government website, uh, that pretty much makes you uh, a target. Uh, you're going to be uh, a high profile site that is going to be focus of uh, lots of uh, hackers and attackers. Most of it is just for the lols or the lols or just for the, the trophy saying, hey, look at this government website that I defaced. At one time, I actually put PHP Nuke as a content management system onto a .gov uh, website. And you can imagine that that uh, ended really rather poorly. <laughs> it was a real total disaster. To even call PHP Nuke a content management system, though, you know, that, that's kind of a stretch. But in those days, we didn't really even have the term content management system. And today, we have uh, other PHP frameworks like WordPress, easily the most popular content management system that does power government websites. Even whitehouse.gov is powered by WordPress which you've got to admit is kind of mind-blowing and naively weird, I mean, right? PHP and all that, and yet here we are. So it, it is possible though, with planning and with a lot of support, you can make it work and it can be safe. Now, if you're going to put Plone onto a .gov website, I think you've got a leg up there because Plone is already super secure. So the job in some ways is, is easier. And in fact, these websites all run Plone or they did at one time. Uh, sadly, I think some of them have moved on from Plone, but uh, FBI.gov runs Castle CMS, which is based on Plone. And so they're, you know, they're all really are quite secure. Now, a lot of lesser well-known .gov sites do indeed run Plone, and I've set up a number of them. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Basically, it's going to be an experience report. What does it take to get Plone onto a government uh, website? Now, your mileage may vary. If you're a .gov contractor, it really does depend what uh, requirements and hoops you have to jump through. The 21st Century Integrated Digital Experience Act, which was passed in 2020, I believe, said that all .gov websites have to have a similar experience in terms of uh, look and feel and search and uh, accessibility for people with disabilities and that sort of thing. But across agencies, adherence to these concepts still is kind of mixed. Some may be low and some may be high. So what you have to do if you happen to be a .gov contractor may vary wildly. So I'm going to tell you what I've faced so far uh, when it comes to, to getting Plown off to the United States government. So let's begin. Basically, there are two kinds of challenges. You'll have to face a static analysis, a dynamic analysis. Of course, you'll also have to face a whole lot of bureaucracy and red tape and paperwork. Now, I'm not going to be able to cover that in this talk, but I will talk about the other two items. Let's start with the static analysis or static application security testing, SAST. This is white box testing, and that means that your security team will get all of the source code for all of your custom content types and your specialized views and your HTML templates and extra JavaScript libraries you may have written and that sort of thing, plus all the configuration that goes along with it. If you're using Docker, they'll have the Docker images. If you're using the uh, direct operating system platform, they'll have access to that and so forth and so on. And so it gets uh, it gets pretty uh, pretty deep what they actually uh, can can get to. Their job is to detect issues from the inside out. Uh, so how do they do this? Are they going to look at the source code line by line and, and see what's going on? Well, no, not really, because if we look at the number of vulnerabilities over time, well, they are just going up and up and up and up. So they're going to use a tool. And now there are a number of tools out there that can uh, support uh, static analysis. Uh, the one that I'm exposed to the most is called Prisma Cloud, although it used to be called Twistlock in the past. 
And basically what it does is I send my Docker image into Prisma and it generates a report and it takes apart that image layer by layer and it looks for known vulnerabilities. And you get what looks like this. Yeah, it's, it's basically just a spreadsheet. And the spreadsheet has columns like what the CVE that it detected, whether it's a low or medium or high vulnerability. And in this case, uh, depending on your agency, again, you may be required to fix maybe just the high vulnerabilities, or maybe you have to fix all the vulnerabilities. Uh, you're told what package of vulnerability was found in and what version of that package you're using. And if there's a fix, what version you'll need to upgrade to in order to get uh, the benefit of that fix. And then you get some description and other metadata. So let's dive in here and just take a look at a few of these. For example, CVE stroke 2020 stroke 362227. This is a vul vulnerability I had in a Plone site, which is using LDAP to authenticate users. And there's a problem in LDAP, it looks like, in version 2448. But if I upgrade to 2457, I'll get a fix. And I can do that if I'm just using the operating system by saying, hey, install lib LDAP at that version. But of course, I'm not using the bare operating system. And a lot of people aren't these days. We're using Docker. And so as a result, we need to fix it in our Docker image. So I'm going to Alpine Linux or packages.alpinelinux.org. And I put in lib LDAP here and I put in the version of Alpine Linux that I have. And I see, yes, sure enough, this is the bad version of lib LDAP. What if I change the version number? If I bump this up to 3.12, I see that, oh, okay, 2458, that's a fixed version, which doesn't have the hole in it. So that's what I need to do. I just have to go into my Docker file. And instead of using Python 2.7.18 on Alpine 3.11, use Alpine 3.12. Easy enough, right? I run a build and I get this error, Python 2.7.18 on Alpine 3.12, not found. Why not? Because, well, it doesn't exist. Uh, this project, unfortunately, is stuck on Python 2 because there are some rather deep uh, objects in the Zope database uh, pickled on Python 2, and there is really no clean way to upgrade out of it. And because Python 2 reached end of life on January 1st, 2020, there have been no updates to the Docker image past Alpine version 3.11. If you need a, a later uh, version of that, you may as well upgrade to Python 3. Well, I can't do that. So some people may be thinking at this point, wait a minute, why are you using a bare Python image when we already have a Plone base image? And in fact, Plone base images with Python 2 and Python 3. Well, there's another problem. And here's some of that bureaucracy and red tape you're going to be facing. Uh, the Plone base image includes this statement, volume data. And again, depending on the government agency you work for, you may be limited in what volumes you're allowed to expose. And in Docker, there's no way to unexpose a volume. Uh, in fact, this is an open issue in Docker that goes back to the year 2014. There's the issue, if you want to see, it is still marked uh, green open today. So what's the real fix? Well, you go to your Docker file. Using uh, Python 2 on Alpine 3.11, you add the bleeding edge repository to your list of possible repositories, and you add libldap at that edge version. So it's quite, uh, quite painful. Imagine multiplying this many more times, because that's just one vulnerability in that spreadsheet, and we have 92 more to go. <sighs> Well, don't worry, I'm not going to go through all 92 more of these, but I would like to just focus on a couple more that are at least directly related to Plone. For example, CVE stroke 2021 stroke 23358. This is a problem in the underscore JavaScript library. Uh, various versions are susceptible to some arbitrary code injection. So how do you fix this? Well, I start off by poking through your omelet. If you don't have collective.recipe.omelet in your build out, you are missing out. This is one of the most useful tools there is to exploring what all goes into your Plone-based application, all of the Python packages that uh, comprise it. So basically, I would run a command like this. Look in the omelet and see where this underscore is. And I see, ah, it's in Plone.static resources. This is where I need to make the fix. And how you do that? Well, you could edit the yarn.lock file with the package.json file and so forth and upgrade the underscore.js dependency. Of course, you need to test thoroughly at this point because this version of Plone was released with a certain known version of underscore.js and you suddenly change things, uh, things may not work. Another option you might have is to patch underscore.js in your Docker image itself by running a patch command and including a patch file. Another thing you've done, and I am not ashamed to say this, 
you could just remove underscore.js from your image altogether. You may possibly break some feature of Plum that is depending on it. Uh, uh, so far, I haven't run into this myself. I've removed certain arbitrary JavaScript libraries and my users haven't complained. So, uh, you know, do this with a very careful and light step if you have to. But no matter what approach you take, please take the time, make a pull request. And if you don't have time for that, at least log an issue in an issue tracker so that everyone who works on Plone can benefit from having this security hole closed. And in fact, for this particular issue, underscore.js vulnerability, I submitted an issue. In fact, here it is in the Plone Static Resources uh, GitHub issue tracker. I submitted it back on July 15th, 2021. Still open, but hey, it's at least on people's radar. And now people will know that we need to fix this in order to improve Plone for everyone. Let's take a look at one more vulnerability, CVE 2021 stroke 33511. This vulnerability is in Plone itself. Uh, the image that was being scanned was using Plone 523. There's a server-side request forgery problem in the LXML parser. Uh, and how do you fix this? Well, the easiest way is just to add the Plone hotfix 2021.0518 to your build out, and then you are done, right? Pretty, pretty quick, pretty easy. You then take your fixed Docker image, you throw it back over the fence, the security team tests it again, and they come back with a report to tell you, hey, that LDAP problem, fixed, good job. That underscore JS problem, fix, good job. And that plone hotfix fix, uh, no, that didn't quite do it. And why is that? It's in the build out. Well, build out is indeed the problem. The scanning tools, they don't look at everything. Yes, they look at operating system level packages. And yes, they look at the Python site packages directory. And they look at Node and NPM. And they look into jar files. Heck, they'll even see if there are private keys in your image that shouldn't be there. But they don't understand build out. So what do you do? You know you've fixed the problem. Well, you do a lot of writing. And here's more of that red tape that I was mentioning before. A lot of the fixes that you may have to do in order to run Plone on a government site doesn't involve code or configuration at all. It involves mitigation statements. Basically having to write out, and how verbose you have to be up with this it depends on your agency, to explain why a certain fix actually does the job. And it can be as simple as saying, hey, you know, Plone Hotfix 2021-0518 of the bell, it addresses that CVE, don't worry about it. Or you may have to be a lot more thorough. Mitigation statements, get used to writing a lot. In fact, I keep an entire library of mitigation statements at the ready to copy and paste for various CVEs that pop up on Plone sites. All right, once you've gotten all 92 of your static uh, problems done, uh, you can go on to the next step. Briefly, though, before we do that, let's revisit this one. This was the LDAP vulnerability. Notice here, the problem is actually in Slapd. That's the open LDAP server, not the client. Plone is a client of LDAP to authenticate users. It doesn't run a server. So we could have solved this with a mitigation statement as well. OK, now let's move on to dynamic testing. Dynamic application security testing, or DAST, also known as black box test testing, the security team in this case does not have access to the source code or its configuration or your Docker images or anything. Instead, what they do is run the application and then they see if they can poke holes into it. They put in some HTTP requests and see what happens. Now, again, the number of CVEs has been increasing over time, so they're not going to try this by hand. They're going to use a tool. And there are lots of tools out here. Here are some of them. Uh, the one that I've been exposed to with the most are AppScan, HCL AppScan, previously known as Rational AppScan, and uh, NetSparker. NetSparker, I actually like a lot more. It's now called Invicti. If the tool your agency uses is AppScan, then I feel sorry for you. It's, oh my God, its reports are just terrible. It's so hard to read. Uh, but basically, the tool works by making HTTP requests, detecting the vulnerabilities in the HTTP responses. Now, some of these tools are pretty sophisticated. They can also install a monitoring system into your site's database and check to see if there are uh, rows appearing that shouldn't have appeared after an HTTP transaction or new columns uh, changing that shouldn't have changed. Now, of course, with Plone, 
we're using the ZODB, which none of these security scanners can comprehend. And in fact, you may even argue that really no one knows what's going inside of ZODB, and that's the way we like it. Uh, so the process is to start up an instance of your Plone site, create a test user for the scanner to use, give that URL and the credentials of that user to NetSparker or whatever scanner you're using, and then you sit back and wait as it does its thing. Now, why are we using unauthenticated user? I mean, after all, if hackers are targeting your site, they're not going to have a user account. They're going to be anonymous. Well, the fact of the matter is, Social engineering attacks are on the rise, and uh, here's the, the data that demonstrates that. Chances are hackers will be able to have a password of some kind. So that's why we do a scan with an authenticated user, a user that can possibly run uh, the various uh, clone management commands like edit a page or cut and paste pages and that sort of thing. Uh, is this all the setup we have to do? Well, actually, there's a few other steps you want to do, uh, do before we let the uh, scanner get to work. For one, do not use your production database. I mean, obviously, if the scanner is going to go through and edit content and move pages around and, and change uh, publication states, it's going to completely deface your site. You want to use a backup and you run it on a separate system. In fact, you may even want to cull the content, pare down what's actually in your database. If you've got a plone site with 10,000 objects in it, you don't need your scanner going through every single object recursively and trying every single Zope method on it and every single plone edit method on it. It'll take years to complete the scan. Uh, you can also configure your scan to avoid certain URLs if there are things that you don't want to be tested, like the manage view list page. And you also, of course, want to disable your JavaScript analytics because there's going to be thousands and thousands of requests going in, and this will really throw off what your uh, web analytics will look like. There's one other thing you need to do, and this brings us to the sad, devastating tale of Dr. Redacted's email. And this is a true story. Dr. Redacted went to a conference. Uh, he's one of the people that I work with on one of these uh, Plone sites, and uh, he brought his BlackBerry with him. He's kind of old school, so that he could check his email while he was at the conference. Well, around the same time, I submitted a Plone site that uh, we work on together to get a uh, dynamic scan. And this Plone site had some content rules set up. And you might notice this rule here at the bottom is uh, any change that happens under a particular folder should send an email to a Dr. Redacted to let him know that uh, something was updated and he should probably take a look. Well, as the scan went through and made all sorts of modifications and publication state changes and edits and additions and deletions <clears throat> to the collaborative group uh, folder, uh, as it was looking for all these holes, it ended up sending over 10,000 emails to Dr. Redacted's BlackBerry. And in fact, his BlackBerry exploded. Okay, it, it was a true story up until the exploding part, but you get the idea. He was cut out of his email the entire length of the conference. So you don't just turn off content rules before you do a dynamic scan like this, because there are other parts of Plone that can send email, like a password reset form. So what I like to do is just turn off email altogether, go to the mail settings and set the SMTP server to something that doesn't even exist. This makes your scan a lot uh, <laughs> a lot safer for people's Blackberries if they still use them. Once the scan is done running, you get a report that looks something like this. And it shows you the low, medium, high, and the critical vulnerabilities you have to fix and um, what you uh, typically have to do to take care of them. Um, you then begin your mitigations, just like you did with the static uh, analysis for the dynamic one. If there's a problem in a certain piece of custom software you wrote, you close the holes. Maybe you have to update Plone or some of its dependent packages. If updating Plone is an issue at this point because of deadlines, uh, you could disable certain features of Plone. Like uh, say there's a problem that was found in the Tiny MCE editor for a site that's still using Tiny MCE. Maybe just turn off that editor and make your content editors write raw HTML for a while. Of course, you can write lots of mitigation statements because sometimes these scanners will say, hey, there's an SQL injection we detected at a certain URL. And you can say, oh, no, Plone doesn't use SQL. Uh, so carry on from there. We use the ZODB. So let's dive into one of these vulnerabilities, uh, one of these dynamic vulnerabilities. This is a cross-site scripting problem that was detected by NetSparker on a Plone 523 site, or I think it might have been 522. And it says, uh, we detected cross-site scripting, blah, blah, blah. And it's in image view full screen. And it shows you the request and the response and, and everything that went wrong. And so you zoom in on the report. And it says, here, we've set the referrer field to JavaScript, NetSparker, et cetera. And here's the nice thing about NetSparker. It actually highlights in yellow. This is not my highlighting. 
this tells in the report, this should not be here. This is bad. So how do you mitigate this? Well, again, you go to your omelet and you find out where image view full screen lives and you see it's in plone.app.content types and you take a look at that template and you can see, okay, it's taking the HTTP referrer header here and it's passing it to URL tool uh, is URL in portal. And somehow this thing is saying, yeah, a JavaScript URL is indeed in the portal. That's fine. So it's putting it into a hyperlink here and that is bad. So um, you know then that the problem is not in image view with full screen, but it's in the URL tool. It's letting JavaScript URLs pass through. So you go to the source code for URL tool.py and you end up on GitHub and see that, oh, okay, a newer version of URL tool is actually filtering out bad URL parts here. You see there's the JavaScript colon scheme right there. So if you upgrade Plone, you should be good to go. Uh, in this particular instance, I did not choose to upgrade Plone because if I did that, that would be a large change which, which would require me to go all the way back to static application testing. I ended up solving this by using JBot to override that image view full screen template to just get rid of the hyperlink altogether. It just shows the image now. If people want to get back to the site, they can hit the back button on their browsers. So that's a perfectly good way to go. And one down and none to go. Now, why this difference? Well, it is typical with Plone that, um, or with, with every uh, web framework, you'll get lots of static problems. Uh, but with Plone, you get few of the dynamic problems because Plone is just that good. That's part of why I love working with Plone. Anyway, that's a lot of hoops to jump through in order to get a website onto, a Plone website onto .gov. And yeah, that sadly is what we're stuck with. You got to go through your static analysis, you go through your dynamic analysis, and I'm not even covering all the other red tape, like the FIPS 199 security classification forms and uh, uh, architectural review boards and defensive postures that uh, various agencies will make you set up. And this process is actually ongoing. Uh, remember this chart, the CVEs are going up. Well, they're going to continue to go up even after your site is running and it's past all of its scans. So although you do a static and dynamic analysis before each release, they happen also post-production. While your site is live, <clears throat> a good security team will continue to test your site, not using an unauthenticated user, but will look at your dynamic images to see if there are some problems that have been detected after you started running. This helps to make the entire uh, web a safer place. And if you continue to make your pull requests and patch Plone or submit issues, if you don't have time for that, this helps to fold these fixes back into Plone and it makes a better Plone for everyone. If you've got any questions, here's how you can reach me. And thanks so much for taking the time to listen to this talk.